there's a difference between being broke and being poor, right? Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind, a depressed condition of your spirit. And you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. So I wasn't poor even though I lived in a poor neighborhood. I just didn't have any money. I'm Patrick Pacheco, and you're listening to season three of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we share our wealth of knowledge to help you navigate the opportunities ahead, because that's what Cadence is all about, the expertise and flexibility to do business on your terms. We're empowered to help, whether it's through our podcast or any of our more than 350 locations across the South and Texas. Often, the story of entrepreneurs is focused on the individual. Steve Jobs, or Henry Ford, or Oprah Winfrey. But every entrepreneur knows that they can't do it alone. We all need a helping hand to reach our full potential. That's especially true for those from underserved communities. And it's vitally important that we help them, because we all benefit from an entrepreneur's success. They bring solutions, jobs, and a better future to their communities. So, how do we empower entrepreneurs? What do they need from us? What can we give them, and what do they need to do for themselves? On this episode, we're building up entrepreneurs with networks, resources, and most of all, Hope. Our guest today knows a thing or two about Hope. In fact, Hope's his middle name. I'm John Hope Bryant, founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Operation Hope. He's kind of a big deal. You know, I'll walk through the airport and the TSA agents will scream out their credit score at me. (laughs) (laughs) John's been called the conscience of capitalism. He's been an advisor to three sitting U.S. presidents and was named one of Time Magazine's 50 Leaders for the Future. Much of that is related to his work with Operation Hope, the largest nonprofit provider of financial literacy, inclusion, and economic empowerment tools in the United States. We're America's financial coach. We're the private banker for the underserved. We're the Starbucks of financial inclusion. We're the Walmart of financial literacy. (laughs) We are raising credit scores 54 points in six months. 120 points in 24 months. Nothing changed your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 points. <laughs> right. But I really think that this is, financial literacy is a civil rights issue of this generation. We're doing what I call civil rights. And I believe that financial coaching and financial well-being in the workplace is what, the, just like what healthcare was 50 years ago, making its way into corporate America, a new norm. And now we have 245 offices in 46 states. We have 4 million clients. We've invested $4 billion of capital of our bank partners' money, including Cadence Bank. John believes that there's a powerful tool out there that can change lives. Entrepreneurship. French word, build something, make something out of nothing. Innovate, create, build. We can do this interview without entrepreneurship. Somebody created that microphone you're speaking into and marketed it. Somebody created those headphones you got on. You can't do any of this that we're talking about here today or even platform this podcast without entrepreneurs. I mean, all entrepreneurs is doing is solving a problem in society. And every big company was once a small one, including Cadence Bank, which is started in the late 1800s, I believe. I think entrepreneurship is not everything, but I think there's God, <laughs> there's love, And then for wealth creation, there's entrepreneurship and small business. After all, entrepreneurship changed his life. So it seems like you've been an entrepreneur your whole life. What drew you to entrepreneurship? A banker, actually. And the fact that I realized that all the other options to not being an entrepreneur were getting my friends arrested or worse, dead. I grew up in South Central LA in Compton, California, and my mom and dad divorced when I was five years old over money. So when I was nine years old, A banker came in my classroom, and he had a white shirt on and a red tie and a blue suit. A lot of the kids were checked out when this guy showed up. They just weren't paying attention. But I was fascinated. He had a beautiful car, brand new, with a license plate and tags on it in the the, the parking lot. It was legal. That's what that meant. He had a business card that said he worked on the 16th floor. Uh, Well, nothing in Compton above a sixth floor building because that was a sixth floor building in Compton was a courthouse. Everything else is first one store tilt ups. So I'm like, who works on the 16th floor? Where, where's the 16th floor? Is that in heaven? So I asked this guy, what do you do for a living? And how'd you get rich legally? And I was dead serious. 
And he said, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. And I said, sir, I've never heard the word entrepreneur in my entire life. I don't know what an entrepreneur is, but if you're financing them and it's legal. I'm going to be one. I'm like, oh, my God, this is your job? It's your job to, like, hook me up with money and capital? Sign me up. I mean, <laughs> I, I was like, this is the business plan for the rest of my life. I'm going to show the hood how to get hooked up by capital. I'm going to move us into the mainstream by figuring out how free enterprise and capitalism works. John sees entrepreneurship as a way of lifting people out of poverty. If the economy is growing at 2 3% a year, and through a job, maybe you take your savings and maybe you can get 3 4 5% return in some interest-bearing account or mutual fund or something on average, you know, how are you going to ever get wealthy that way? You can make a living, you can make a life, you can have a good standard of living all your life, which is great. That's what most Americans do. But if you want to create generational wealth, you got to own a home, which has compounding effect. You have to own a business. You have to own stocks and bonds. You got to take. You got to take. Basically, it's taking a risk on enterprise for an outsized potential return. That is me all day. As an entrepreneur, you don't have to answer to anyone but yourself. It can also give agency to those who need it most. So it's funny. So I went to law school, and one of the reasons I went to law school is I thought, no matter what happens, it doesn't matter if anybody likes me, whatever, I can always hang a shingle, and I can always say, this is Patrick Pacheco, lawyer, and I can make a living. That's it. That's all freedom, by the way, Patrick. You, what you just said was another way of saying I'm free. You don't like the way your employer's talking to you? Bye. <laughs> you don't like the way your contractor's talking to you? Bye. I mean, it's freedom. It's self, all freedom is is self-determination. John speaks from years of experience. He started his first business at the age of 10. My mother had some money and I wanted it. She's like, no, life's not free. You got to work for it. So while I was trying to jive talk my mother out of some money, I realized that this concept of a business that this banker would talk to me about was all around me. It was a muffler shop. It was a nail salon. It was a barber shop. It was a liquor store. And so I went to the liquor store on the corner that sold candy and I told the guy who owned the liquor store, it was a black man named Mr. Mac, and uh, he owns Mac's Liquor Store. And he sold candy, a little candy counter with nice glass display. And I said, sir, you're selling the wrong kind of candy. Patrick, he said, go away, little boy. I've got a college degree. I'm doing very well. I said, no, I've got cavities. I'm, I don't care how many degrees you've got. I'm telling you, I'm a kid. I'm telling you, you're, you're selling the wrong kind of candy, man. You just have no competition. He said, you should come sell candy for me at the, at the counter. I'll pay you very well after school. I don't want to work for you selling candy. I've never wanted to be somebody, somebody's performer. I never wanted to be the guy cashing the check. I want to be the guy writing the check. And I wanted to own my product, not sell it. I said, no, no, no. I'll tell you what. Make me a box boy. He said, you must not be very bright. That's the worst job I've got. Well, I want to work. I want to be a box boy. I want to work and do inventory in the back. All I wanted to do was to figure out where he bought his inventory, which was on the side of the box. <laughs> and within two or three weeks, I sort of figured out that my gut was right. And so I went back to my mother and told her I had a business plan. And I just needed, and I said, here's where I need to go buy my inventory. It was smart and final. She loaned me 40 bucks. They sold me some candy at wholesale rates. We were on the road to school. Max Liquor Store was out of the way to school. I was right on the way to school. And on, in my den, I created a neighborhood candy house and made $300 a week on a $40 investment and put the liquor store or the candy business in a, in a few weeks. And of course, my confidence and self-esteem went through the roof. That was the beginning of a journey of entrepreneurship that's lasted all these years. John figured since he could do it, everybody could do it. But if you haven't noticed, John's a little exceptional. I was an arrogant, not very nice overconfident, obnoxious person because I had gone from cop in California and South Central LA and all the story I just told you. And then I walked through the valley in shadow of no opportunity, and which felt like death. I was homeless for six months of my life when I was 18 years old. I had a lot to hear in airport in Los Angeles. You couldn't tell me anything about struggle. And so I thought racism had been, I thought racism had, had died. I mean, look at me. But John's experience wasn't shared by everybody in his community and it took a major historical event to open his eyes. Then the Rodney King beating happened. You think about it, Patrick, it was the first time the videotape was used in a social justice moment like that. It was like, like George Floyd was caught on a cell phone. This was caught on videotape. 
of these officers beating this guy mercilessly. Now, Rodney King was a model citizen, but he did not deserve to be beat to the edge of his life. And so I said, well, this is America. Rodney King may go to jail for what he did, and the officers are going to go to jail because this is America. And all the officers got off. I mean, it was a wake-up call for me, and I just felt like a fraud. I, I felt like I'd been selling wolf tickets my whole adult life because I believed that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you know, the, the rhetoric of, uh, of the preamble of our freedom and justice for all in this country. And here was, this was injustice. Justice was just us. I mean, it was just, just them. I mean, it was a spiritual moment. That's when John found his true calling. So uh, I started Operation Hope, short answer. I went to my church, went to my pastor and asked, I said, I'm not a civil rights leader. I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm a capitalist. Like, what can I do to help? And he said, John, you can't grow this community unless you rebuild it and, and create jobs and access to capital and opportunity. That's what you do. Take your business skills and put them to work. So I did a banker's bus tour through South Central L.A. on May 5th, 1992, the founding date of Operation Hope. Put bankers on a bus. Bankers have always been this cross section of my life. And we found a, the first guy who, whose pharmacy had been burned down. It was Handler's Pharmacy and rebuilt that pharmacy after the Rodney King riots, first commitment to rebuild. So we've always been about action. It seems like you've connected economic inequality with social injustice. The economic and the, and the social really are, are the same in so many ways. And I think Operation Hope really, really picks that up. At Cadence Bank, we're here to help the people and communities we serve prosper. We have the understanding that comes from listening to your needs and the expertise to make it happen. Find out why Cadence is the bank for you. Visit CadenceBank.com to learn more. Cadence Bank, member FDIC. Entrepreneurship is hard no matter who you are, but underserved communities start far behind more privileged ones. So how do you empower those entrepreneurs? It starts with understanding what they're up against. So what other challenges do entrepreneurs face when they're starting a business? Access to capital, human capital, mentorship capital, relationship capital, and financial capital. I probably missed one, but that's, you know, so you got to go about accumulating your buckets of capital so that you can compete. In their pursuit of capital, entrepreneurs get told no all the time. An entrepreneur, if you don't have, if you're not resilient, this world will run you over. You got to take, you, you got to learn success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Like you just have to never give up ever, ever, ever. Don't take this stuff personal. It's not personal. It's just business. Capitalism is a gladiator sport. It's not personal. <laughs> you need to be passionate about it, but don't take it personal because you're going to get so many no's and so many rejections that if you take it personal, it will destroy your self-esteem. A friend of mine who's a billionaire, 300 richest man in the world, Tony Ressler, he would say, if you don't quit, you can't fail. To survive all the rejections, entrepreneurs need to have faith in themselves. But that can be hard when you don't have a support system and you don't see those outcomes in your community. So education, family structure, financial literacy, self-esteem and confidence, role models and environment, those five things. And when you're robbed of those things or three or four of those things, it's really hard to succeed. And so to your point, sustenance poverty is just roof over your head, food on the table and, and a reasonable you know, health care and sort of ability to live. All other properties are mindset based. So anybody listening to this, if you want to understand why poor people stay poor and why a check casher is across you from a bank branch, it's a mindset issue in most cases. It's something we can solve, but you can't blame poverty on the poor. Racism is real. I mean, if you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. You model what you see. One way to empower an entrepreneur is simply to believe in them. I might add that my mother, Juanita Smith, told me she loved me every day of my life. So I didn't really have a self-esteem problem. I, I, I had an expertise problem or a lack of business plan or, you know, I didn't know what my purpose was, didn't know what I was going to be doing. But I, thanks to her, I was broke, but I wasn't poor. And there's a difference between being broke and being poor, right? Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind, a depressed condition of your spirit. And you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. So I wasn't poor even though I lived in a poor neighborhood. I just didn't have any money. I love the point you made about being poor and being broke, because I, I came up with first generation college students. We lived in a 13 by 20 foot trailer and, you know, we'd run out of propane and made my grandparents come pick me up to take me so that so it wouldn't freeze in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And but I never thought I was poor. That's right. 
Never thought it was poor. And, that, and the self-esteem that they can give you by not feeling like you're somehow below anybody else. So they were great. And, uh, and I, I can never thank them enough for, for what they did there. That's the tragedy of, of slavery. That legacy of, of being told for 270 years of unpaid compensation to slaves and another 100 years of Jim Crow, that's the legacy that unfortunately has in people's mind that they actually are not valuable, that actually that they are poor. And in a blind town, a one-eyed man's king. If you don't know better, you can't do better. And as an old Southern saying, Patrick, no matter how much I love you, my son or my daughter, but if I don't have wisdom, I can only give you my own ignorance. So out of love, we pass down bad habits from generation to generation and maybe pass down low self-esteem and lack of confidence and lack of belief. Disadvantaged entrepreneurs also lack relationship capital. I was with um, Dan your CEO uh, at a ribbon cutting we had for a hope inside and we met the mayor of the city. Well, the mayor's father served on the board of the bank and the mayor's son was an employee for the bank. Now I don't see anything wrong with that at all. It's the way the world works. But what I reminded the mayor and his son is the blessing of relationship capital and proximity to power, which allowed three generations to be associated with this growing bank. It wasn't that they were geniuses or they were brilliant, but they had proximity and relationship to opportunity. And as a result, they benefited through three generations. What happens to the black kid or the Latino kid or the poor white kid who grew up in the ghetto? Well, they're not going to get that job or that internship. They're not going to serve on the board in all likelihood. They don't have the relationship capital. It's not about the competence. They don't know Dan. They don't have they don't have the ability to go into the corporate suite without some help. Another way to empower entrepreneurs, especially ones of color, help them build their network. Every relationship opens doors and provides opportunities. And we have got to understand that these are non-concentric circles. These are, these are circles that, that never connect unless we connect them. And that's why I love our partnership and what we're doing between Operation Hope and Cadence Bank and conversations like this where it begins to demystify some of the assumptions and presumptions around why some poor people are poor, remain poor, and what we can do about it. The reality is, but for the grace of God, there go I. Because if the people listening to this were born in a different zip code (laughs) to a different family, you'd have a different reality. This is good advice for all entrepreneurs. Business is about relationships. A connection with, say, a banker can be a game changer. And then you go over to the bank and begin to make your case, begin to build a relationship with that banker, not trying to sell them on a transaction, not trying to get a loan. In fact, life's about what you give, not what you get. Build a rapport and a relationship with that banker. Let them get to know you. You cannot grow a community or a company without a banker. Find a a banker at Cadence, in this particular example, and get to know them. Build a relationship with them. Take them to coffee once a week. Buy them a donut or her. (laughs) Get in their head and there's in their heart, not just trying to get in their pocket. And at some point, after a few weeks of you romancing this banker, they will say, tell me more about your business or let me come by and see what you're doing. Or, you know, this, 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 I'm, I'm interested. You know, what, do you have any needs for your, uh, your business? And you and try not to be too enthusiastic when they ask you that. Like, you got to be cool about it, right? Yeah, yeah, actually, I do. I do have some needs. Well, what are they? Oh, you know, it'd be nice to have a, lot, a modest line of credit. Be nice to have a banking relationship. Oh, well, wow. let me see if I can work on that for you. And then that person might have a $10,000 signing authority. You never know. Entrepreneurs need resources. So Operation Hope answered the call with their initiative, One Million Black Businesses. And the name says it all. One MBB created after, in the backdrop of the murder of George Floyd in October 22 is when we launched it. With $130 million backing from Shopify, our mission uh, is to create a million new black businesses by 2030. So how does Operation Hope help aspiring entrepreneurs? What, what do you do to, to help in this process? We connect you, we platform you, we endorse you, we, we train you, we, we mentor you, and we frame you up, and then we get you in the ball game. Sign up to the One Million Black Business Initiative. You're listening to this, 1MBB, and we're going to give you a Shopify license for free. We're going to give you a domain name for free. We're going to give you a website for free. We're going to give you payment systems for free. 
We're going to give you credit counseling. Get your credit score up for free. Help with a business plan. Getting it developed for free. We're going to help you stand up an e-commerce business that will either be a new business or will plug into that existing restaurant or barbershop or whatever it is you've got. That allows you to now get business from around the world, not just around the corner. And not just when you're open, but 24 hours a day. And then we're going to get professionals, professional bankers and uh, accountants and lawyers, et cetera, who will provide a couple hours of free coaching to you, counseling to you, to wrap around, to give you some infrastructure for that business. And the initiative, a resounding success. We've already created 230,000 black businesses in two short years. So simple math would show that we're actually ahead of schedule. The numbers are so shocking. I mean, my, name, my middle name is Hope, but even I'm shocked. There are 3.1 million black businesses in America, and we've created 230,000. So that's 7.5% of all black businesses in America created by one, created, aided, supported, stood up by one organization, which is Operation Hope. Entrepreneurs can also empower themselves by listening, learning, and consistently showing up. You got to keep upgrading your software every day. Never get arrogant. Never, never become overconfident, obnoxious, or checked out of your business and believing that it's going to sustain forever. Remember that Blockbuster was everywhere. All of us had a Blockbuster date on Friday night, and Blockbuster's CEO threw their nose up at the founder of Netflix, who came with a modest offer to buy them for $50 million. Blockbuster could have bought Netflix for $50 million. And Blockbuster threw their nose up arrogantly and said, we are Blockbuster, we are everywhere. And now Blockbuster is dead. By the way, so is JCPenney, so is Sears. All these companies were overconfident and didn't listen. God gave you two ears and one mouth to listen twice as much as you talk. We have humility, I'd like to believe. We hustle every day. We never give up. We don't take anything for granted. And we try to reset our software for an upgrade, be open to new thinking, all the time. I love that Dan, your CEO, always shows up for our ribbon cuttings because he shows up, I show up. Neither one of us are too good to show up. We show up to these little small towns where there's like, there's more bank employees than there are visitors in the audience sometimes, but you got to show up. You got to underscore how important it is to be present. And this also communicates your values that you really are ride or die with your employees, your customers, your partners. Ultimately, entrepreneurs control their own future. So what's your message to all these aspiring entrepreneurs out there? Let's go do something. If you haven't been inspired by this podcast, something's wrong with you, you need to go check your post. <laughs> it's not about me. It's just a radical movement of common sense. I mean, I mean, what else do you want us to do? You want Caden's Bank to come at the house and pick you up and drive you to the finish line? At this point, you should just be ready to go. You should call Caden's Bank and make an appointment with one of the bankers. Or call another bank. I'm sure Caden's bank, I've met Dan, he doesn't, he's competitive, but he he wants everybody to succeed. Call any bank that you're comfortable with. Call Operation Hope or call the Urban League or call, call somebody. I mean, this is your time. This is your time. And you've got a little computer in your hand. This didn't exist 20 years ago. When I was growing up, this didn't exist. This phone is a computer in your hand. You can search anything. Do something other than searching a song. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so the message is you just got to start. Just do something. Entrepreneurship can be life-changing, but we have to set people up for success, especially those from underserved communities. We need to help them develop networks and relationship capital. We've got to share resources and mentorship, and we've got to believe in them because entrepreneurship is hard. If we can create situations for entrepreneurs of all backgrounds to succeed, John sees a bright future. We're about opening doors of opportunity, and we call all this, Patrick, the third reconstruction which I believe we're in between now and the year 2030, I think we're at this 10-year period, is the third Reconstruction. The first Reconstruction was after the Civil War, and it was about freedom. The second one was during the Civil Rights Movement, and that was about access. And this one, I believe, is about opportunity for all. And I really feel there's a real shot at achieving it before the year 2030. Thank you to John Hope Bryant for a lifetime of empowering others. If you enjoyed the show, we'd appreciate it if you'd write a review in your podcast app. Or if you're short on time, you can just rate us five stars. It only takes a second. And while you're there, subscribe. We'd love to have you. 
Because when you're with us, we're in good companies. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Sheena Cochran is our production coordinator. Our executive producer is Daniel Cornell, with writing and production from Andrew Gannam and sound design and mixing by Ben Cranlett, at Lower Street Media. I'm your host, Patrick Pacheco. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank makes no representations or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. To the extent that this podcast includes predictions about the economy, these predictions are subject to a number of variables and you should confer with your legal, accounting, and tax advisors for their input regarding the possible outcomes of any economic subject matter discussed herein.